So with that, it is my pleasure uh, to welcome you all today to our July 2024 keynote webinar. Uh, we are incredibly excited and fortunate to have Dr. Carolyn LeClure here uh, to speak today on the approach to the spasticity patient. Dr. LeClure comes to us from the Institute of the Hand in Paris, France. Uh, we are also very fortunate to have Dr. Paul Malone as our moderator. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Dr. Malone is uh, not only an education committee member, but he's a consultant and hand surgeon um, in the UK. So it's my pleasure to introduce today's moderator. So Dr. Malone is a consultant in hand and peripheral nerve surgery at Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham. And he is a hand and nerve surgeon within the NHS, uh, within the National Hand and Service in, in Birmingham. His particular interests rest in spasticity, peripheral nerve injury, and rheumatoid arthritis. And he is a clinical partner of the James Lind Alliance, which focuses on problems related to traumatic brachial plexus injuries. Um, I've mentioned it before, and, and we can't thank him enough for volunteering his time as an education uh, committee member. And we're very fortunate to, to have Dr. Malone with us today. And with that, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. And um, thank you so much to um, Carolyn Leclerc. Um, who has written here is a full-time hand surgeon, but also the president of the Institute of Man in Paris and France. So we're really honoured um, to have you here. Um, you are a well-known expert in treatment of paralysis of the upper limb, especially around spasticity and tetraplegia. Um, and so we look forward to listening um, to what you have to say today. Um, there's over, over 30 of us here on the live webinar as well as more people later on the YouTube. So um, a reminder, please just post all your questions um, into the questions tab at the bottom and we will go through these at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, um, Dr. Caroline Leclerc, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Let me try and share my screen with you. Okay, here we are. Okay, is this working? Is this working? Yes, looks good. Okay, thank you. So thank you for the invitation. It's uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here with you. And uh, and uh, I'm supposed to be in slide mode. Uh, is, can you see it in slide mode? In in a slideshow? Okay, that's better. Uh, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here with you and to share uh, what I've learned over the past uh, fifteen uh, yeah fifteen years or twenty years. Uh, about the spastic upper limb, uh, my uh, approach to um, uh, the paralytic uh, hand uh, went through uh, tetraplegia to start with. And um, over the years, I started getting interested in uh, spasticity. Uh, those are really, really different fields, and uh, both of which are very interesting, but I find probably uh, the spastic. Uh, problems of the upper limb, the most uh, complex uh, that I have had to uh, to uh, work on, and uh, I'm going to try and make things as uh, simple as possible. So the Institut Lamas has now uh, 13 and not 12 uh, hand surgeons. We it was started by Professor Tubiana and also Professor Gilbert, who's a well-known uh, neurosurgeon, especially. Uh, dealing with baby uh, brachial plexuses. Uh, we do a lot of uh, teaching and research, and uh, we welcome uh, residents uh, for six months uh, fellowships. So um, if we need to, uh, to define spasticity, I think uh, one of uh, the best uh, definition is uh, the one that was given many, many years ago by Lance, and uh, spasticity is uh, actually it's more a symptom. It's it's a motor disorder, and it is uh, dependent of on the speed. It's an increase of the stretch stretch reflex, but that is uh, visible uh, uh, only with uh, velocity. Uh, so that means there is an increase in the muscle tone. This goes along with exaggerating reflexes and it can 
the mountain clones. The problem with the first problem we have is that the presentation of uh, spasticity of the upper limb is uh, varied and extremely complex. The uh, main causes are in children cerebral palsy, in uh, any uh, age group head injury, TBI, traumatic brain injury, in um, mostly older patients stroke, and then there are other uh, causes, tetraplegia is one. So you see that we deal with all ages of life, actually, when we deal with uh, spastic patients. And I'll go quickly on that. And uh, the, the, the one thing, there's just a few things I would like to emphasize here. And the, the most uh, important in my eyes is the importance of examination. There is no need for very sophisticated ex um, uh, paraclinical examinations or tests or whatever. The clinical examination for us surgeons is what is going to uh, help us decide what uh, is possible to do for the patient. So this clinical examination is going to be uh, always, every time possible, a group examination, not the surgeon uh, uh, alone in his or her or private place, but together uh, with, the, with the physiatrist, the physical therapist, the occupational therapist is also an important part of, of, of the whole thing. And uh, the, if all these people are together, we uh, examine the patient better. We uh, uh, see every aspect of his or, or her problems. And, uh, and by thinking together, we think better and we come to much better decisions than uh, if it's fragmented. The environment has to be uh, quite specific. It must be quiet and warm. If we're dealing with children, there must be a lot of toys, but not the noisy kind, silent kinds. And uh, if we need to do painful procedures, uh, such as nerve blocks, this is always going to be done last. Uh, we need to remember that spasticity increases with emotions, with fatigue, with a number of... Uh, of um, uh, circumstances, the, the cold weather and, and, and so forth. So it's uh, very it's very much recommended to repeat examination before making any surgical decision because the picture may vary from one time to the other. So we it's very rare that we do make any decision before uh, several examination. Uh, and another um, thing which is important is to record our examination. So we have some standardized charts and as much as possible, this is one of them, I won't go into the details of that, but we do fill them preoperatively after toxin uh, and after surgery many times. And the second important part is video recording. We do a lot of videos of the patients. This is a very cool uh, thing that my uh, occupational therapists have designed. It just consists in putting the camera under a transparent table, and you see, you see the thumb much better than you would on a regular examination because the hand is very often in pronation and examining the thumb is uh, is difficult. So those those are the little things that that are very helpful. So first we look at the patient. You know what is the deformity? It's very often in a deduction and internal rotation of the shoulder, but not all the time. Sometimes it can be external rotation and a deduction. The elbow is often in flexion. The wrist is often in flexion and pronation. And uh, in children, there is often also an honor. Uh, deviation of the wrists is more, uh, it's not as frequent in stroke patients. Where it becomes very difficult is uh, for the fingers. You see here a few of the different deformities that you can have uh, linked to a spasticity of the fingers. So it can be a, a finger clawing, it can be boutonniere, it can be a, a it can be an intrinsic plus hand, it can be many things. And our, um, uh, yeah, and I'm forgetting about the thumb, which is often in a deduction or flexion and a deduction. And this is a so-called thumb in palm deformity. But uh, our goal after looking at the deformity is to try to understand what is the cause of the deformity. Why have the fingers moved in this or that direction? And from that, 
then we can decide if the patient can be helped with surgery and uh, how it, he, he or she can be helped. Of course, here I'm going to speak only about surgery, but we never embark on surgery in a patient that hasn't, uh, who hasn't had uh, prior examination and treatment by our colleagues, uh, either neurologist or physiatrist, and, and the surgery is just a part of the big chain of treatment that we can offer to the patient. But this is what I'm going to be focusing on today. I won't talk about the medical treatment. So the deformity is obviously caused by the spasticity, I'm sorry, uh, to start with. But then there are other, other uh, problems which uh, add up to the spasticity. And the first one is muscle contracture. After being spastic for so many uh, months or even years, uh, those muscles can uh, start getting fibrotic and then there is contracture and we need to address that. There can be also joint contracture and muscle imbalance. So how do we, how do we sort this? Well, spasticity, we know its characteristics. It's mostly on flexors and pronators or on other muscles, but it's very elective. It's going to resist passive stretching, but eventually it's going to yield with a return to the spontaneous pro um, posture. And it's um, it comes together, as we said earlier, with hyperreflexivity. Uh, the assessment of spasticity is difficult. The commonly used Ashworth scale is not very satisfying. It's too uh, general, as you can see here, and it's too uh, examined independent and we favor now more and more the target scale and uh, with the v3 angle of catch and this is velocity dependent you have to do it fast in order to find and this is the v angle here of uh, the elbow flexors and uh, this is uh, much more precise uh, in in order to examine uh, the, the spasticity then muscle contracture. Muscle contracture, as we say, it comes in the same muscles. Uh, it is permanent as opposed to spasticity that will yield, and it's only going to be improved if we have if we are dealing with a B or triarticular uh, muscle. They are often associated, but their treatment treatment is different. And for this reason, we must absolutely be able to distinguish the two. We have tools we have, uh, to help us, and uh, nerve and or muscle blocks are uh, something that we use routinely. And with the use of those blocks, spasticity yields, but contracture persists. So in cases where we have very um, severe spasticity, they are extremely helpful. And we will see later that they are also helpful in other cases. We have a number of uh, uh, tests and, uh, and angles uh, that, that help us. I won't go through the details of that, but we have a number of, uh, of methods and measures that help us. So this is a phenoketo test that help us uh, look at the uh, contracture of the intrinsic muscle. And of course, if we have muscle contracture at a certain point, a joint that doesn't, hasn't been moving for some time can get deformed. This is a little more difficult because um, if you have muscle contracture, you're not going to be able, in a number of cases, to detect the underlying joint contracture. And in the end, it's only at surgery, after having removed or, or released the muscle contracture, that we can decide, uh, find out if there is also joint contracture. In some patients, mostly children, it's not stiffness, it's hyperlaxity, instability, and this also needs to be treated. And finally, the last but not least problem is muscle imbalance. Those muscles who are spastic are generally active, but not all the time. They can be strong, they can be weak, they can be paralyzed. But on most cases, they are active. Uh, the problem is that because of the contracture, their evaluation is quite difficult. This, this is a 12 years old uh, young girl, and we ask her to uh, move her fingers actively. And you can see that because of this severe deformity of her wrist, there is not much difference between active flexion and extension. If you try yourself to bend your wrist like she does, uh, you'll see that flexing your fingers becomes difficult. So uh, sometimes we are in doubt. 
And then there is the antagonist muscle, the one which are not spastic. Basically, if we are dealing with spastic wrist flexors, the wrist extensors are, are going to be the antagonist and not spastic, but often they cannot uh, be activated. Are they paralyzed? Not all the time. Sometimes they are only what I call here pseudo paralyzed because they just prevent it from working because of the spasticity and or the muscle contracture of the agonist spastic muscles. So this also is difficult to evaluate. And uh, before going, uh, let me go back, before going to the next one, uh, their um, uh, botulinum toxin is, is going to be extremely uh, helpful because if there is spasticity of the flexor muscles after putting some uh, toxin in those spastic muscle and relieving the spasticity, then maybe we can evaluate the antagonist muscle and find out if they are active or not. Another thing that I will go very briefly on is dystonia. Dystonia is something else. Uh, this is uh, one of the, uh, of the um, definitions that has been given in voluntary muscle contractions, mostly patterned and repetitive, which make it difficult. You can see here this poor girl, when she tries to grind something, her own arm goes all over the place. Dystonia, in most cases, is a firm contraindication to surgery. And uh, of course, just like everything else, there are exceptions to that rule. But beware of dystonic patients. We usually do not operate on them. So the other tools we have been talking about, EMG studies, are not very helpful in uh, unless very specific cases. However, on the, uh, on the opposite, as we said, uh, uh, sorry, uh, nerve and muscle blocks can be very helpful. I like botulinum toxin because it's a long duration effect. It lasts for two or three months. And during those two or three months, you have plenty of time to repeatedly examine the antagonist. As I said earlier, maybe you're going to find out that those antagonist muscles are indeed active, provided uh, spasticity is relieved. And then we can examine some other muscles, such as the intrinsic muscles of the fingers. When you have spasticity and or contracture of the finger extrinsic muscles, there is no way you can examine those intrinsic muscles after uh, botulinum toxin in the extrinsic flexor muscle, then you can assess uh, possible spasticity of the intrinsic and it is frequent. So we can add that in, in our uh, preoperative planning. This is a pretty nice example of a young girl, uh, or young boy, I'm sorry. Uh, he has cerebral palsy. He's uh, nine years of age, and uh, he has a problem with the thumb in palm. And we identified spasticity of his thumb AD doctor, so we put some exclusively some to toxic botulinum toxin in his thumb AD doctor. And then we did this video recording of this test called A. HA, we call it AHA, pre-toxin and post-toxin. Very sorry, he wears the same T-shirt for the two for those two dates, but you see that there, there's different uh, tags, and, and you can see how he performs uh, during this uh, examination. For those who don't know the AHA test, uh, the child is uh, asked to play a role. He's not asked how to perform, so he does it the way he can. So this is after the toxin, and you see you can grab that black thing. Here, this is with uh, the pencil case. Before the toxin, he has no use of his uh, um, left hand. And you see, after the toxin, we didn't tell him how to grab the pencil case, but he was able to grab it. And uh, this is even more, uh, shows even more. This is the, the bottle, uh, and he has to put his uh, marbles in the bottle before the toxin. No use of the hand unless a press. And you see, after the toxin, big difference, he can grab the bottle. And so we know that by taking care of spasticity, just of spasticity of this muscle, we are going to improve probably improves his function pretty much. 
We need to remember that the sensation can also be uh, impaired. Usually the basic sensations are intact and the complex sensations such as, such as proprioception and stereognosis are uh, altered. You need to uh, identify any problem very uh, carefully because if you want to do functional surgery in a hand that is not sensate, you're gonna fail. So you need to have at least some sensation for in the hand for, um, for you to be able to provide uh, some function. I won't go through the functional examination. Uh, it's not performed by ourselves. It's uh, usually performed by our team of, uh, of therapists. There is a number of uh, tests that can be done. Uh, let me insist of bimanual bi bi activities. This is important in hemiplegic patients, so you can really see how they, um, they act in uh, when when they are in situation time recording is also very interesting see you know how much time it takes to do the same thing before toxin or or after toxin or after surgery and um, functional examination with a questionnaire of daily life is also very uh, important and so this is all of the scales and all the tools that we have. And again, I won't go into the details. The one thing that I, I, I would suggest is that if you are starting to do this, uh, uh, this type of, of surgery and you need a good evaluation, choose a set of tools and stick to them. And keep always the same tools to evaluate your results. We need also to remember that those patients uh, have other neurological uh, problems that need to, to be taken care to be taken into account before surgery, lower limb, upper function. Uh, they can they can also be uh, uh, an important cognitive impairment, which which does not necessarily mean we won't operate on them, but it ne needs to be uh, appreciated before uh, before the surgery. Emotional stability is also a problem. See this little boy. Uh, he has a definite problem in his uh, left wrist. We need to do something to it. He's all over the place all, all day long. He spits on people like you see here. He's, uh, he, he's very hard to, to deal with. So we are going to do something. But knowing you know, uh, his, uh, his uh, difficulties, we are going to do something simple and very uh, strong. Uh, if we if we take care of him, we should also remember about the problem of expectations, and this is very typical of teenagers. Uh, they are taken care of with their uh, cerebral palsy since they are very small, and then around the 12, 13, 14 age uh, years of age, they kind of disappear from the scene. They are a bit fed up with the rehabilitation and orthosis and, and, and meetings with the doctors and so forth. And they come back around 15 or 16 and they say, could you do something for me? And if you if you question them you know, quite precisely, their, um, uh, their demand is very often cosmetic at that age. And you need to hear that because if you try to improve their function, they're not interested. They've had this problem for 15 years or 16 years. They've adapted to it. They have found solutions, but they want their, their elbows, their wrists, their hand to look better. If you fail to understand that, you're not going to help them. So now we have been uh, uh, examining the patient. What are we going to do? What can we do for, uh, for these patients? Well, um, first we need to understand what we can do and we, what we cannot do, of course. Spasticity, we can improve. Muscle contracture, we can improve. Joint contracture, we can improve. Muscle paralysis, not all the time, because if you want to improve muscle paralysis, you need another muscle or sometimes another nerve who is going to be um, transferred to that paralyzed muscle. This is not always the case. We're not going to be able to improve sensory deficit. And as I said earlier, dystonia, we don't know. We surgeons don't know how to help. Second question, what is the goal of our surgery? Is it function? Of course it is function every time we can, but in many cases, function cannot be a goal. And if you take this, uh, uh, this poor uh, 65 years old who has uh, no communication at all with the environment and, and lays, uh, lays in bed uh, w without movement, 
the, the only things we're going, we're going to be able to do without voluntary movement, the only thing we're going to be able to do for him is improve his nursing, diminish his pain, improve the hygiene, improve the, the, the care of, uh, of, his, um, of his helpers. And, uh, and third, uh, we talked about cosmesis. Uh, this is something that also can be improved, provided we understand what uh, what the um, what, what the question was. Uh, sometimes we have to operate uh, quite early if there are orthopedic deformities that are worsening. And I'm thinking of some uh, uh, traumatic brain injuries with severe uh, elbow or wrist uh, deformities that keep worsening despite uh, all medical care. And, and then we are kind of forced uh, to go on to, uh, to doing some surgery to those, uh, to those, to those patients. So if we are dealing with functional surgery to restore function, the main principle is to restore the balance. Why do I, what do I mean by restore the balance? Well, we've talked about this. We want to reduce the spasticity. We want to release the muscle contracture. And we want to reinforce voluntary control. Let's, start, let's take the example of the wrist again. If I reduce spasticity, of the wrist flexors and the finger flexors, if I release all the contracture of the same muscles and the wrist and the fingers are paralyzed, I'm not going to help the patient. He's going to stay in this flex position. I need to bring an active uh, wrist and or finger extensor together with the previous two surgeries. So that tells you that we often, often do multiple procedures, multiple scars, long surgeries, and we need to explain all that to the surgeon. So first, reduce spasticity. How do we do that? Well, there is one surgical technique that can reduce spasticity. This is referred to as partial uh, neurectomy. And I've been doing quite a lot of, uh, of work on, on those partial neurectomies. And so our goal here is to cut part of the motor nerves, but we want to reduce spasticity, but we want to keep the uh, muscle tone. And of course, this is only effective on spasticity and not on muscle contracture. This is a very nice drawing of uh, the uh, different types of partial neurectomies that can be done, that can be done at the trunk level. It can be total or partial. What we are talking about here is the distal neurectomy. I have termed it hyperselective neurectomy because we cut only part of the motor branches to any spastic muscle as it enters uh, nerve, I'm sorry, as it enters the muscle. And uh, so I, I will go fast on the truncular technique. And the truncular technique is the one that deals with cutting more proximally. And uh, this has a little bit of drawbacks uh, because uh, it relies only on electrical stimulation. And uh, it creates some difficulties in the results. It may miss part of the branches and injure sensory branches. Whereas this hyperselective neurectomy is done at the uh, very uh, tip of the nerve, and you cannot miss your target, and you are sure to diminish, um, you are sure to get rid of the spasticity. It is also, uh, so this is one, uh, I hope nobody uh, is shocked by those uh, cadaver dissections. You can see here the musculocutaneous nerve, and you see the branches here for the biceps. There's three here, there's one more here, and there's three branches for the <coughs> brachialis, I'm sorry, and as a sensory branch leaves off the nerve here and goes uh, on its own to the forearm. So what we do is intervene at this level and cut, cut part of all, each and every one of those branches. This is a view of the motor branch to the FCR. And you see, we can di divide it in several little branches and cut part of them. Of course, uh, pre op Perioperative nerve stimulation is important for that. We, this is a tool that we really need. And uh, this is very briefly the result of, uh, of uh, our major studies that we published in 2021 on 42 patients who had only um, um, hyperselective neurectomy um, 
performed and uh, with a follow-up at six months and at 30 months. And uh, we were uh, extremely uh, satisfied to see that uh, not only the spontaneous posture of the limb improved, uh, the uh, range of motion did not uh, was not very much changed because those patients had no contractures, they had only pure spasticity, but we were very satisfied to see that the strength of those flexors, this is the patients with the elbow flexors, uh, neurectomy, has not diminished, instead it has increased a little bit. And all the markers of spasticity have shown significant diminution of spasticity. So we were quite happy to see that it, uh, it works. We are um, currently working on long-term results of uh, this procedure, and we are uh, probably going to be able to come out with uh, our next paper at uh, almost six years of follow-up, which shows uh, a stability of the results. So that's quite satisfactory. I'm, I'm, I'm passing uh, uh, fast on, on, the, on the rest. This is pronation and reflection. The only thing is that there is a little relapse of the spasticity during the first six months, and then it is stable. This, uh, this little relapse of spasticity is non-significant and has not been uh, an impairment uh, for the functionality of, uh, of these patients. Um, so uh, this is one of the uh, results. This patient, uh, who is a CP patient, uh, had uh, um, uh, hyperselective neurectomy of the elbow flexors and the wrist flexors, and you see that he has now excellent and well-controlled uh, wrist flex uh, elbow flexion and extension, and he has a, a very nice uh, wrist uh, active wrist extension. Second uh, part of this uh, treatment is the release of muscle contracture. Here again, I'm not going to go into the details of all these techniques because there are many. Of course, we can do a tenotomy, we can do a muscle slide, and we can do some uh, lengthening uh, inside of the muscle and the tendon. We have done in the past a lot of tenotomies. Well, nowadays, before cutting a tendon, we just want to make sure that maybe we could use it for a transfer, for instance. And so we think twice before doing that. Uh, the, the famous muscle slide for the wrist flexors, uh, which, was, which was referred to as the flexor pronator release or middle epicondylar release. We have done a lot of these also. I must say we do much less of them because uh, now we have some, uh, because they were very, very, uh, um, uh, uh, this, this was big dissection with a big risk of hematoma and often often uh, uh, quite uh, important uh, weakening of muscles. And uh, now we prefer to do some tendon muscle lengthening. Every time we can, the lengthening is going to be performed at the junction between the muscle and the tendon. And when this is not possible, uh, we will do, as you can see here, a Z type of lengthening uh, in the tendon itself. And uh, this is quite satisfactory. This is one of the cases where we cannot do um, intramuscular lengthening. This is the biceps. And uh, you can see actually here that we did the muscle lengthening of the three elbow flexors. And we found at the end that there was uh, 35 or 40 degrees of joint contracture. But that was only after the release of the muscles. We decided not to treat the joint contracture in this patient. And this is a fractional lengthening. That's our, uh, our preferred technique uh, nowadays. And you see that we do several cuts in the tendon, but we keep the continuity of the muscle. After this procedure, there is, there is no need for immobilization. We can start again with uh, voluntary movement uh, of the patient, and, and this is, uh, this is quite, uh, quite satisfactory. It's also quantitative. You can do as much as you want, and uh, that's also very helpful in these patients. Uh, this, I'm sorry, was not supposed to be showing. 
Okay, so in some cases, as I said, you have spasticity and contracture. And so in these cases, we are going to treat both at the same time. This is a, uh, a result of a study we did, but that's not uh, uh, so important. Let me show you a case. This is a cerebral palsy adult, 32 years old. And you see he has very severe uh, spontaneous deformity. When we do the tardier test, you see that his uh, angle is 120 degrees, which is quite severe. And so we did at the same time, hyperselective neurectomy and lengthening of the elbow flexors. And this is, you can see the dramatic change in uh, the spontaneous posture and also the, the big change in his uh, active motion in, uh, in uh, his, uh, uh, in his elbow, the patient was so satisfied that he asked us to go on with uh, improving uh, the hand. And here, in his case, we did the arthrodesis uh, of the wrist. Another uh, lengthening which is worth m mentioning is the so-called STP. This is uh, performed on non-functioning hand, and you see that uh, it's for the flex finger flexors. And we cut the profondi. Uh, proximally, we cut superficially, distally, we let them slide and we switch them to each other. Uh, this is a simple procedure. Of course, it gives very limited active flexion, but for non-functional hand who have very severe flexion deformity, it's a nice procedure and it's helping. In some cases, there is also severe joint deformity, and especially at the wrist level. And in those cases, the soft tissue procedures are not helpful. It is uh, uh, impossible to restore uh, some, uh, some uh, adequate um, wrist uh, position uh, with soft tissue position, uh, procedures when it is uh, at this level. We used to use those big uh, plates. We have now moved to much smaller plates. You see that if you do that, you are in need to lengthen all those the finger flexors. Otherwise, you're going to end up with uh, uh, finger deformities that's going to be worse when you bring the wrist uh, back up. Uh, this in children, we can do partial uh, arthrodesis. I won't go into the details of that, but this leaves uh, the growing, uh, the growing um, plates uh, in, and you see this here. Uh, this is a, a, a partial uh, arthrodesis uh, in a child. And finally, the last uh, type of procedures that we're going to do is reinforcement of voluntary control whenever we can. This is done with tendon transfers. Nowadays, we start uh, in some cases doing nerve transfers, but I think it's too early to... Uh, to talk about this uh, and to give our results. And this is where dynamic electromyography can be helpful. Because if part of the muscles are spastic and the other part are uh, paralyzed, you know, what, what choice do we have? Well, we can use a spastic muscle if it is strong, of course, it, if, if it has a strong voluntary control, but we need to make sure that it has this ability to relax and to be phasic, as, as we call it. And this is where dynamic EMG is helpful. And you see here, um, that's from uh, the Hoffer article, we make sure before transferring the FCU that this FCU is able of relaxing. And so what is the best muscle for a transfer? Well, the one that is strong and capable of, of uh, relaxation. So we need to examine that. This is an interesting uh, article for regarding children on 40 patients with CP. And it showed that the best results of tendon transfers were between 7 and 12 years of age. So we need, that's another reminder, that we need to operate those children early in age, and I do agree about starting those surgeries after seven years of age. This is a transfer of the brachioradialis onto the wrist extensors in this um, nine years old child. Uh, so, as I said earlier, we do often combine procedures. We try to perform all procedures in one. Uh, in one session whenever possible, but in many circumstances it's not. If we have to de deal with the shoulder, with the elbow, with the wrist, with the fingers, with the thumb, we have to split that in uh, in several uh, procedures. 
uh, but at least what you need to do is to do the rebalancing of one joint or area all at once, diminishing spasticity, diminishing uh, contract, relieving contracture, and uh, doing tendon transfers. So if I have a few minutes, I just want to show you very briefly two cases. One is um, uh, this type of uh, patient who have uh, uh, very um, uh, difficult, uh, severe uh, mental uh, cognition problems and uh, who uh, get uh, very severely contracted uh, with uh, pain, uh, nursing difficulties, hygiene difficulties. And in those cases, we will do um, uh, step, uh, uh, stepped uh, tenotomies of the shoulder, of the uh, elbow, of the wrist. And in his case, we did an STP. Uh, we often uh, try to operate both sides uh, simultaneously in those patients who are fragile. And uh, post-op rehabilitation has to be very careful with splints and everything. But here we can help them pretty much. And the last case is a 12 years old, 12 years old cerebral palsy child. He has a typical uh, spontaneous posture in pronation, wrist flexion, and thumb adduction. His goal was functional. He said he was not interested in uh, in in cosmetics. So he had. I'm sorry. Let me go back very quickly. He had spasticity of his pronator terrestre at the time we did tenotomy. We, to, to, today, we might probably uh, choose differently, and we would do uh, a HSN, hyperselective neurectomy of the pronator terrestre, but this was many years ago. He had both spasticity and contracture of the wrist flexors. We did a lengthening and the transfer. The best muscle was the brachioradialis. He had the spasticity of the thumb adductor muscle, and here we did a first web opening. This is before surgery in blue and nine months after surgery in yellow. So here we are before the surgery, and you see he, he has function, and you see that nine months after the surgery, of course, the way of grasping things is much nicer. This is before surgery again, and you see that his uh, grasp is very rudimentary after surgery. Of course, the position of the thumb is much better, and he grasps much better. You can see, however, that at nine months, per, nine months post-surgery, he has to be very concentrated in order to use his hand. It is not automatic for him. He, ha he really has to be careful when using it. This has improved over time. That tells you again that this young boy, boy is 12 years, and, and 12 years in his case is probably very late, and we would have loved to see him earlier. So as a conclusion, repeated clinical evaluation, there is no, no such thing as a standard procedure. We want to restore the balance. In children, we want to operate early. And probably I should add that experience is important. It is not easy. The decision making is not easy. And uh, we are much more clever together than each on our uh, little area. This is uh, for those who are interested, the courses uh, we run uh, twice a year in Budapest. There is a basic skills course which will uh, take place uh, next October and November, which is both for surgeons and rehab specialists. We work together and uh, we have three days of fun all together. And, and there is a uh, um, there is an advanced course for surgeons in, in uh, April or May. Thank you so much for listening to me. And uh, if there are questions, of course, I'd be very happy to answer. Thank you very much, Dr. Ligler. Um, so if everyone can post any, any more questions in the Q&A panel and keep them coming in. I've got a number of questions that have, have come up. Um, but just, just to ask before that, how many surgeons are you working together in spasticity at the Institut de la Man? Uh, there's three of us. Three of you. Three of us. We were, there, was, there was two of us, and we have a third surgeon who just joined us. And uh, I don't do a, a lower limb, but both of the other surgeons also uh, operate on lower limb, which is really nice because I always felt terrible having, you know, to transfer the patient to another group and another, uh, another surgeon for the lower limb. So there's three of us now. Thank you. 
shared shared decision making and and choices. Oh yeah, but uh, you know, you're talking about decision making. Uh, every uh, twice a week, we take our car and we go to rehab centers, and and this is very very time consuming. But that's how we prefer to see the, the patients. We go to the rehab centers and and we see the patients there. Wonderful. Um, here's a question in um, from somebody saying after an STP, that superficial to profundus transfer, um, they've noticed a lot of swan necking in the patients. Um, do you feel that this causes significant problems for these patients? And what do you then do um, in terms of further treatment afterwards? And do you have any tips to avoid swan necking if it's a problem? Yeah, that's a very good question. Before doing STP, you must uh, assess uh, laxity or even hyperlaxity of the patient and any tendency to a swan neck deformity. Uh, if this is the case, there is one little tip that can be very helpful. You can still do that uh, the technique, but what you need to do is uh, when you are cutting the uh, flexor superficialis, don't let them go into the hand. Keep them uh, on, on a... Uh, on, on a suture and towards the end of the procedure, we attach them to the flexor uh, profondi after the lengthening. So you do a simple tenodesis, you know, passive tenodesis, keeping the fingers in a little bit of PIP joint flexion, and this will prevent uh, uh, the, the swan necking. But that's a very good question. We had this problem uh, early on, yeah. Wonderful. That sounds like a great tip, a great approach. Um, what do you feel your, another question, what do you feel your most successful intervention is for a clasped thumb or a thumb in palm deformity? I suppose that's the, the holy grail really, isn't it, for many? Um, what do you feel the best corrective technique is for a clasped thumb or thumb in palm deformity? Okay, so the answer would be to come with me to the Budapest course. We spend about three hours on the thumb, and at the end, we still don't know what to do. No, that's a joke, but uh, there is no one answer. You know, uh, uh, as I explained in, in, uh, in this uh, very brief uh, uh, session, you know, I'm going to examine the spasticity, I'm going to examine the contracture, and I'm going to examine the uh, muscle imbalance. And so I may end up doing hyperselective neurectomy because we do of uh, the um, uh, deep branch of the motor nerve and the recurrent branch of the radi of the median nerve, I'm sorry. I may end up doing, uh, we do a lot of carpal tunnel release uh, in order to help releasing the, the muscle the contracture. And I may end up to do and end up doing a transfer of any muscle to the extensors of the thumb. And in some occasions, especially in children with uh, uh, hyperextension of uh, the MP joint, I may do a stabilizing procedure uh, for, for the MP joint. So I may do four procedures, you know, if required, but I don't have one best procedure. Okay. Uh, thank you. One other question here is, um, do you see there's a role for nerve transfers in spasticity for muscle paralysis? And if so, are there any nerve transfers that you recommend? Uh, okay. You know, again, we don't we don't have recipes, <laughs> but uh, uh, we have we have starting we have started, excuse me. Uh, thinking about nerve transfers when we were doing hyperselective neurectomy. So we were cutting those nerves, you know, cutting and cutting. And then we ended up with those tiny little bits of nerve and say, you know, could we do something with them? Uh, why, why not transfer them, you know, to, 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 a, to a paralyzed uh, muscle? And that's how we started. So uh, we've, we've done two uh, publications, but they are anatomy publications, both of them, uh, looking at transferring a branch of the brachioradialis uh, to the uh, wrist extensors. And of course, if you are going to do hyperselective neurectomy of the brachioradialis, which is often spastic, why not take this little nerve and transfer it to the ECR muscles, which are often uh, paralyzed? And uh, and then uh, we keep moving on uh, uh, in, in this field, uh, but you know I don't want to talk too much about it yet because one of the big difficulties we have is that we never uh, do those uh, procedures uh, separate from the rest. Uh, 
uh, it wouldn't make sense, you know. If you are going to try and restore uh, active extension of, of the wrist, you need to, to relieve spasticity and you need to relieve contracture at the same time. So the results, do they belong to relief of spasticity, relief of contracture or tra of nerve transfer? So I think we need to find uh, some very good models and this is what we're working on right now finding good models. Actually, if the Global Nerve Foundation would be willing to help. I just thought about that when uh, uh, during the presentation, you know, we would love it. And, uh, and so we need to find good models, we need to find good ways of evaluation, and then we can talk about it at, at more. more. A, a question on evaluation um, was a question on PROMs that you use, so patient-related outcome measures. Um, so it said you use the Tardew scale um, and you use the Ashworth. Um, and do you ever use the ARMA score amongst others, or are there any other patient-related outcome measures you might use, like the DASH or otherwise? Oh, the dash we haven't found uh, helpful. No, we we do um, we do uh, some form. We don't perform exactly the, the gas DA score, but some form of gas score. We define with the patient very clearly uh, the goal of uh, the the goal of the surgery. Uh, not only into categories, but uh, also in in some things that they would really be interesting to achieve. Uh, and then we discuss if this seems reasonable or not, and and then we can work on on some of those goals. Uh, we use uh, we use the uh, uh, VA scale of course, and uh, and and but uh, that's that's mostly the 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 P Rome that we've been uh, using so far. I, I'm I'm sure we need to work on that more, uh, but again with the help of uh, our uh, rehab uh, specialist because. <laughs> Uh, examination is so lengthy, you know, we need everybody to be involved in, 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 in that evaluation. Thank you for that. Um, another question in, do you think there's a difference between outcomes regarding the cause of spasticity? For example, uh, the outcomes um, in cerebral palsy better than, say, for an elderly stroke victim? Oh, uh, I wouldn't say better or worse, but uh, what I can say is that in cerebral palsy, we tend to have more functional goals than we would have in uh, uh, in stroke patients. Uh, and uh, my best results have been in young patients who had uh, mild uh, problems, mild deformity, mild problems. And, and then you can really improve them to almost normal. I'm not going to say normal, but almost normal. Um, in TBI patients, that's, that's quite uh, difficult. Sometimes traumatic brain injuries because of the associated uh, um, uh, behavior problems and also because we get some very, very severe uh, muscle contracture that we need to uh, deal with uh, quite early in some patients. And so we end up doing... Uh, Things we may not be exactly what I've been showing uh, here today. Uh, we may, you know, have to release the biceps at some point very early because it's uh, the contractor is getting so, so, so bad. We're going to do a tenotomy of this or that, uh, and then see the patient again after so many uh, months or years and reevaluate things. Um, yeah, and uh, oh, the worst by all means, is uh, spastic tetraplegic patients. Tetraplegia, I mean, uh, medullar uh, lesions, who on top of it have spasticities, those by far are the most difficult cases. There is no two patients who are alike. There's a mix of flaccid, of flaccid paralysis and of spasticity, and this, these are really, really difficult. Uh, I mean, for, for us, it's... Uh, we, 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 we have to think hard and many times and, and do many botulinum toxin to help us in order to decide what, what we do for them. For them. Okay, wonderful. And perhaps just the last couple of questions before we pull to a, a close. Um, one to ask, um, what do you feel for the role of contralateral C7 or C7 ah. neurectomies? And that's perhaps quite a big question, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I might uh, send them to uh, uh, to an article that has just been or is going to be published in the next issue of the uh, European Journal of Hand Surgery. I've been asked to do a, 
uh, an article on nerve procedures, and uh, and I, I comment at length on on that procedure. Uh, I. Um, I, I, I know the team who does it. I have been there. Uh, no question, they are brilliant surgeons and, and they do these procedures remar remarkably. Uh, probably we need to have uh, more international teams trying this surgery before we can, uh, we can decide if it's uh, helpful for our Western uh, patients. And uh, there is also some uh, great interest uh, nowadays in uh, the part of that surgery, uh, the, 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 yeah, the, the results of the part of the surgery, which is just the neurotomy of the C7 on the spastic side. Uh, what, what is the role of C7 neurotomy? And, and there is a big international study which has been done. And actually, uh, if I may, I, I, I want to mention uh, the next, uh, the next course, you may be aware of it already, Paul, that will take place in Barcelona in May next year on nerve procedures in spasticity. We're only going to talk about nerves, and, and there's probably going to be a lot to be said uh, on, on uh, how much uh, uh, nerves can help us with these patients. Wonderful. Thank you. And, um, and perhaps... Tying in with that last um, question, just asks um, the Budapest course that you mentioned, what kind of experience is required for participation on that from anyone attending? Uh, not not for the basic course. For the basic, the basic course, uh, just, you know, come in <laughs> and we'll try and we'll try to teach you uh, what we have. But for the uh, advanced course, you need to have some experience. Was that the question? I wasn't sure. Was that the question you, you were asking? No, I think that was it. I think he was asking for the, the basic course, what is okay. required. For yeah, no, no, the basic course, any, anyone can attend. There is one mm -hmm. day, one full day of lecture and two full days of workshops for the surgeon cadaver dissection, for the uh, for the uh, rehab specialist, some uh, uh, ultrasound, some um, um, uh, clinical testing, some a lot of things. And uh, we get together often during those two days for a lot of clinical cases. And then the advanced course needs a bit of prior experience, hey? The advanced course is only for surgeons. And uh, we ask for people either to have attended the, the first course, uh, the basic course, or, or to have at least three years of experience with those patients because we don't go back to the basics. It's only cadaver dissections. So, so it's only we, we spend two days dissecting. It's more on techniques, I would say. Wonderful. Dr. Caroline Leclerc, thank you for a wonderful hour, a wonderful presentation. Um, I think that there's masses to learn and still to be learned, yeah, but we've well, learned a lot from you tonight. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure and um, talk to you soon, maybe. Thank you all. Thank okay. you. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.